everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Elaine Christian with the City of West Palm Beach Office of Sustainability, and we are so excited to be partnering with University of Florida's Croc Docs today to chat about Florida's unwanted invasive animals. We have Justin with us today, and I can't wait to learn more about invasive species. If you have any questions during the presentation, please drop them in the chat box and we will have Q&A at the end. Also, right after Q&A, we're going to launch a short anonymous survey poll that will give us valuable feedback about today's program. So please stay with us until the end. Keep in mind that if you like today's program, we have many more scheduled. You can always visit wpb.org slash screen to view our upcoming programs. I will also be sending out a follow-up email after today's presentation, which will include the recording in case you'd like to share it or watch it again and also important links and resources mentioned today, which will also include our web pages. And now let's transi transition to Justin um, so that we can find out more about Florida's invasive species. Justin? All right, thanks, Elaine. Well, I'm excited to be here with you all today and thanks for taking the time out of your Fridays to tune in. We're gonna go through um, I'm going to be talking for about 30 minutes or so, and as Elaine mentioned, we'll get to some of your questions at the end, so hang on to those and make note as they come up. So let's go ahead and just get started. Um, so again, my name is Justin Dalaba. I work for the University of Florida at the Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center, and today's presentation is actually a, also a partnership effort with the South Florida Water Management District. So kind of quickly, um, who are we? So I'm a part of a team called the UF Croc Docs, and we're a team of biologists, researchers, and managers on the forefront of reptile and amphibian research and conservation in South Florida throughout the Caribbean as well. So a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about specifically today. Um, so many of you have tuned in because you're interested in sustainability, and a big part of sustainability is safeguarding Florida's biodiversity and natural resources from things like invasive species, um, which are a big threat in South Florida. So first we're gonna talk about what's the problem and why do we care and talk about non-native reptiles in general, but then moving more specifically for the focus of this talk, we're gonna be covering a number of large constrictor species that you can find here in South Florida. Then we're gonna talk about some of the management efforts that are being done and what we currently know. And then we'll talk about the role of citizen scientists, which is all of you and the importance of that in research and management. Then we'll, we'll go through some identification of a number of different species and talk about a reporting system that I'll give you a quick walk through on how to use so that you can help provide valuable data to researchers. So starting out with what's the problem in general? Um, so if we look at this trend over time of introduced species, and I wanted to define that term and a few others now that are gonna be used throughout this talk. Um, so introduced species are basically plants and animals that have been brought to Florida from somewhere else in the world and are non-native. Um, non-native, introduced, and exotic are terms that can be used interchangeably established means that there's a self-sustaining population and they have become established and are reproducing. So looking at South Florida in particular, um, if we look at the change in time uh, by decade, you can see this blue bar represents the number of introduced non-native reptiles and amphibians. And we have at least 185 introduced species as of the most recent summary in 2016. 63 of those have become established and more continue to show up um, over time. So why is South Florida or Florida in general an, an exotic species hotspot? Well, we have a thriving trade in ornamental plants and exotic pets, as well as major ports of entry for those species to come into Florida. With occasional destructive hurricanes, that increases the risk of escapes and that combined with the subtropical climate really provides the right conditions to support the establishment of non-native reptile and amphibians year round. So talking specifically about reptiles in Florida, 
in, in amphibians and reptiles in Florida, we actually have more non-native reptiles and amphibians than anywhere else in the world. We also have more species of non-native lizards breeding in Florida than native lizards, and the largest snake in Florida is invasive. Now, this figure on your right is called the invasion curve, and if you take nothing else away from today's talk, the key point I want to drive home is that we hope to shift this point where public awareness typically begins to lower on the curve. The sooner we can get eyes on the ground identifying and looking for invasive species, the better chance we have to get rid of those before they become a problem and become a long-term management issue. So South Florida in particular is vulnerable to invasive species um, because of this strong potential for the establishment of reptiles and amphibians that are found commonly in the pet trade. And invasive species basically means one that causes harm to the environment, economy, or human health. So this is an ongoing threat in South Florida. Um, we're mainly concerned with the fact that they outcompete and eat native wildlife. And in the case of large constrictors, which we'll be talking about today, that includes competing with other top predators such as the American alligator um, or the Florida panther. And they also consume a lot of prey species, including native mammal species. They also have the potential to spread diseases and parasites, and they're incredibly expensive to manage when they become a long-term management problem, which is an obstacle to the restoration of the Everglades. So why do we care? As I mentioned, invasive species are most harmful directly through what they eat. Um, for those of us uh, who are not in research, they can be a threat to pets left outdoors, um, and they also have the potential for economic impacts. But um, for our research and other agencies we work with, we're concerned with questions like, are they causing imbalances in our ecosystem? For example, by driving down the amount of food for native predators, um, causing declines in prey species, are they increasing the risk of extinction for imperiled species? And are they causing declines in our fish and game species? Um, the wildlife that we like to hunt and fish for. So on the right, you can see here a hypothetical figure that was put together by Skip Snow. Um, and this really exemplifies just how dramatic a Burmese python's impact can be on an ecosystem. So this is a hypothetical diet for one Burmese python to reach 13 feet in length. And you can really see the abundance and diversity of wildlife that it would have to eat to reach that length. Now, these are two examples of over 15 foot pythons that um, have been found and captured by UF biologists in the Everglades. And you can see that they grow quite large. And that's looking back at that hypothetical diet. Um, you can imagine just how many of our native species a snake this large must have eaten to grow that long. Some Particularly, uh, species of special concern are, um, these listed here are some of our imperiled and threatened species. So the ones in red actually have already been found in the gut content of Burmese pythons. So the federally threatened wood stork and Key Largo wood rat have both been found, as well as up to at least 39 species of um, wading birds and other birds in Florida have also been found in a diet of pythons. But they're also concerned, they have not been found to eat them yet, but they're concerned for things like our Florida panther um, and American crocodiles because they're competing with some of these top predators. And they have occasionally been found um, eating American alligators. So what are some of the management challenges? Well, in the case of Burmese pythons, we don't know exactly how many there are, but we know that there are a lot of them. Um, the problem is that most of them happen to be in remote and inaccessible habitats. So it makes complete removal very unlikely, and they're incredibly difficult to detect due to their camouflage and cryptic nature. So you're most likely to encounter them 
on levees and roads where they're going to be crossing out in the open. So if you look, um, take a second and see if you can figure out from the photo on the bottom right um, how many pythons are there. And that's just to exemplify how camouflaged these can be. There's more than one python in that picture. So talking about some of the research that's being done to help improve our management and detection, there's a number of tools that we can use and the ones listed here include not just UF, but interagency efforts um, to better understand the problem. And those include things like eDNA, which is basically taking water and soil samples to detect presence or absence of rare and cryptic species like the Burmese Python. We can also use detector dogs that are specially trained to smell and seek out particular species. For example, you can train a dog to specifically smell out a Burmese python, and that helps more quickly detect them, but also to monitor expanding ranges. Um, there's also ongoing scout snake projects, which involves radio tracking an adult to help find other adults of the opposite sex. So while Burmese pythons are typically a solitary species, they do form breeding aggregations from about now through April, and that helps us remove more than one at a time. And with large reptile traps, um, we can use those to set up in remote areas with remote cameras that send an email um, to monitor for and potentially trap specifically large reptiles. They're designed to exclude bycatch like small mammals and things that wouldn't be able to um, trigger the trap. And you can see in this photo, this is a large reptile trap. Here is a, a native cottonmouth taking advantage of seeking out those prey scent trails that are things like uh, rodents that have been going in and out of the trap. And it's sitting there waiting to take advantage of that. So one of the most effective management tools to date, because pythons have such a low detection probability, are paid removal contractors. And there are a number of programs going on um, with paid incentive to remove pythons and actively survey for them on roads and levees across South Florida in the Everglades. Now, um, Two examples are the South Florida Water Management District's Python Elimination Program and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation's Python Action Team Removing Invasive Constrictors. In short, you can call them PEP or Patrick. Um, and these programs have been responsible for the removal of over 6,000 pythons so far. To put that into perspective, these are relatively new programs that have launched in the last several years, and that's roughly half of the number of pythons that have been removed in total so far from Florida. Also kind of a cool figure from the Python Elimination Program, you can see here the total length of pythons that they have removed in comparison to some uh, other benchmarks such as the maximum depth of the Grand Canyon, Empire State Building, and the total height of the Eiffel Tower. So that just puts it into perspective um, how many pythons and how long they can be. So how can you help? Well, citizen science is one of the most important tools we have with management as well, because it helps fill in knowledge gaps from areas where we're not actively looking and provides important data, both locally and regionally and across large ge geographic scales. So, this contributes to our greater understanding of the extent of the problem, and it also helps researchers and managers more rapidly respond to sightings of invasive species because we can't be everywhere at one time. So having more eyes on the ground looking is incredibly helpful to um, research and management. So what should you look for? And again, I'm referring specifically to um, large constrictors here, which we'll go through a number of those species in just a few minutes. But in general, what you should look for are um, large snakes crossing roads and levees. As I mentioned, you're most likely to find these species crossing roads and levees. They can also leave long tail drags, uh, trails and drags in the mud. So you can see from the bottom photo, this is actually a person for scale 
Um, those are some drags from a very large python in a dry down in the Everglades. So in general, be aware of your surroundings and know if you're in an area where you might cite these species. How do you know if you're in an area? Well, I'll show you a couple of resources and provide links as well to Elaine to share with you at the end. Um, so you can be aware of where you are and where you're most likely to find pythons and other species. Where specifically should you look? Well, these can be found almost everywhere. Um, well, I mentioned that they're primarily in remote and inaccessible areas. They can also be found in urban areas, and some have been found in garages, on boats, and crossing high traffic roads. You can see in this photo, this is one who, a uh, Burmese python that has just poked its head over onto the road. And typically, this is what you'll see is um, you might at first think it's a stick extending into the road, and then at closer look, you can see the rest of the snake's body. So these are going to be found in both disturbed and natural areas. Any roads or levees that are directly adjacent to canals, wetlands, um, or any source of water, you're going to have a pretty good chance that you might find um, a non-native constrictor such as the Burmese python. When should you look? They can be found pretty much at all times, both day and night. Uh, but there are times that are better to look than others. So one of the best times to see pythons is actually in early morning hours when the snakes are just coming out to sit and warm up in the sun. And when we have cooler days, a stretch of cooler days like we've been having the past week or so, you can actually um, find them curled up basking in the sunlight. And they also, when it gets down to even colder temperatures, and potentially even closer to freezing, they'll seek out warmer locations, which usually means bodies of water. In the hotter summer months, they can be found crossing paved roads and unpaved levees even more frequently, and especially after a heavy rain. So now we're going to talk about how to identify non-native large constrictors. Quick hint, they are large. What I mean by that is if you wanted to use this kind of fun guide to social distancing, think about the amount of distance you would want to keep between yourself and others. And if the snake is that long or even larger, there's a good chance it's not from Florida, with a few exceptions that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. The colors and patterns are going to vary between species and even within species, but there are also a number of native snakes that are commonly confused for these. So I want to also talk about those after we go through some of the identification of our non-native species. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the most widely established in South Florida, and that's the Burmese python, which is an invasive species, meaning it does cause harm to the environment, economy, and human health. Now, one of the reasons this is such a big problem is we've actually found from almost a decade of data um, in 2012 a study came out to show that we've actually had an almost up to 99 percent decrease in certain mammal observations in Everglades National Park and that was linked to this increase in the Burmese python invasion so they are a huge threat to our mammal species and also wading birds Adults can reach over 18 feet in length. I think the record as of this year was 18.9 feet, and they can grow up to 150 pounds. So how do you know a snake is a Burmese python? If you look at this picture, this is a really great example. You can see what's referred to as uh, often people say they have a giraffe-like pattern. You can also look at it as puzzle pieces that fit together. They have these kind of dark blotches with tan outlines, um, almost like puzzle pieces. And one of the other key features in identifying them is this dark arrow-shaped wedge on the back of their head. And they'll also have a dark line running through and behind their eye, which is a common trait in across different python species. And you'll see that in just a minute here. So looking at Reports of Burmese pythons, this is all from uh, a public reporting system, which I'm going to share with you all 
And this is an example of what kind of data we can look at when citizen scientists report what they're seeing, including Burmese Python. So looking at the number of sightings, there have been quite a few throughout South Florida. You can see they're pretty widely established almost across all of the Everglades and into the urban areas as well. So in green, you're seeing treated sightings, meaning that those individuals were removed, but red is showing you verified sightings, meaning that those individuals have been confirmed with photographic evidence or by identification from a wildlife expert. And another interesting thing to note is a lot of these sightings are occurring primarily along roads and levees. So that further exemplifies the point that you're most likely to encounter them crossing roads and levees. Another established species in South Florida is the Northern African Python. So this one is actually much more localized. They're not established across South Florida, but in a small population in Miami-Dade County in an area called the Bird Drive Basin, which is kind of a buffer zone between the urban boundary and the natural Everglades. Um, these can grow up to 12 feet long, not quite as large as the Burmese python, but one of the key identifying features here is you'll notice this curled tail, which is something that they tend to do um, when they're curled up basking or even in defense. They'll have a, a much, well, somewhat lighter body, but the other difference between these and the Burmese pythons is you can see already the pattern on the back is actually continuous. The blotches blend together more rather than those puzzle piece like um, patches. So looking at their range, as I mentioned, it's very localized. This is zoomed into that small localized population in the bird drive basin. Um, this is just including public sightings, but I believe the number of verified sightings is actually around 40 or so individuals. So not many, but there are, there is an established population, um, and these are a species of concern to be on the lookout for. The next one I'm gonna talk about is also established in Florida and is considered invasive, and that's the common boa constrictor. So these are actually slightly smaller, even more than the Burmese and Northern African pythons. And they're also commonly called the red-tailed boa. So the reason for that is they have these dark brown, red saddles or blotches near their tail. So that's a key thing to be looking for. Um, they also have lighter ovals separated by brown saddles on their body. So the color is slightly different. And their population is again, fairly localized, but these are common in the pet trade. So it's definitely a species that could show up in your area um, as a result of somebody releasing or losing their pet. So um, one thing to note with these as well is they're semi-arboreal. So that means basically when they're younger, they're spending some time foraging in trees and shrubs, but as adults, when they become larger, they'll spend most of their time in the terrestrial environment on the ground. Looking at the range in South Florida, these are again, sightings to a public reporting system that we'll get to in just a minute. And you can see in green, the number of treated sightings right here is where the localized population is considered to be in South Florida. And then also red is showing you verified sightings. So you can see already that they have been found um, widely across South Florida, in quite a few of them. The next set of species I'm gonna talk about, note that these are actually not established. And I also wanna take a quick break and mention that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be providing some additional resources and guides on identification of these at the end. So if at this point you're feeling a little overwhelmed and I'm gonna be throwing a lot of different species at you, don't fret. We don't expect you to become snake experts by the end of this, um, but hopefully we can learn a couple of tips and tricks with identification. So the next one is the ball python. These are not established and not known to be breeding in South Florida, but they're also a species of concern because they're so common in the pet trade. Now their pattern in colors can, are highly variable. There's hundreds of different variations, 
But the most common you'll see is this one pictured here, which tends to have um, sort of these rounded blotches and, and dark brown, black body. But the reason they're called a ball python is the easiest way to identify them is they're typically curled up into a ball um, when threatened or uh, in defense. And these are gonna be much shorter. The reason that they're so common in the pet trade is they are, uh, they don't grow quite as large. So they're easier to keep in captivity. They grow up to maybe four feet long on average. But as you can see, there have been quite a few found throughout Florida. Zooming into South Florida, you can see most of them are um, commonly found in residential and urban areas. So um, again, there's no established population, but occasionally pets get out um, or are released. So be on the lookout for this one as well. The next one is a Dumeril's boa. You can already see they have this kind of crazy pattern. Um, and this is another one that does not grow quite as large, but is still larger than a lot of our native snakes. So average length is between three to six feet, but they can rarely grow up to nine feet long. And they have these really irregular saddle patterns on their back. Now, if you're not sure, how to tell between this and say one of the other species that I've mentioned, the best thing that you can do is just take a picture of it um, and I'll show you how to go about reporting that um, in the next set of slides after we cover some of the native species that look like these. We're also, um, I'm just kind of gonna quickly go through the next few here, but um, yellow anacondas and green anacondas are both species that um, I've heard commonly confused with the Burmese python, which is established in Florida. Both of these are not established. However, there have been a few sightings in Florida, very few. Um, the yellow anaconda, the reason that they're somewhat con sometimes confused with Burmese pythons is because of their patterning, um, but they have a more yellow gold body with darker spots. And um, you can see from this photograph here, they have these five longitudinal stripes on the back of their head. So that's another kind of key feature to look for. And with the green anaconda, which you can already see looks much different from the yellow anaconda because it has these really prominent circular dark spots. Um, they're not going to have those five stripes on their head, but they do have this dark band behind their eye. And then another one that I want to mention is the amethystin or scrub python. So these again are not an established species, but they're a reptile of concern because they can, can grow particularly long, um, up to 18 feet. But the main difference with these is they're more slender body and they're primarily arboreal. So you can see this one is actually on a branch. These are gonna be more likely seen in trees, but they are a common species in the pet trade. And if one were to escape, um, that would be something that we would want to know about and definitely report. The last non-native snake I'm gonna talk about today is the reticulated python. So these are a very large snake. They can grow up to 18 feet long, um, sometimes longer in, in captivity. But the big difference with these and other snakes that can grow that large, such as the Burmese python and Northern African python that I mentioned earlier, is this orange eye. So their color is gonna be different. You can see they have a, a bright orange eye and along their body, these golden tan blotches with sort of yellow and white accents. And um, that's bordered by this really dark black. So we can't talk about all of these native species with, uh, I'm sorry, non-native species without mentioning some of our native snakes that are commonly confused, but also talking about some of the uh, reasons that they're so important. So pictured here is a great egret one of our native wading birds eating a native banded water snake. And this was taken by one of our biologists, Brittany Mason. 
So they're actually, our native snakes are important both as prey and predators in the ecosystem. So they help maintain balance in the food web. Um, for those of us who may not like snakes so much, one of the reasons that they are important is they help reduce pet, pest rodent populations. And that's gonna also encourage healthy crops and reduce the spread of diseases. So let's just go through a few slides here and talk about some of the commonly confused species. So the first thing that I wanna point out with our native water snakes, these are species that you're going to find in some of the same areas and are commonly confused due to location because they're typically found around marshes and sources of water as the name implies. Um, but they don't have this dark stripe through their eye and extending past the eye. So that's one of the key features that makes them different. In addition to being smaller in size than the larger adult animals, but I put in here a photo of a Burmese python hatchling for reference so you can see there's that dark stripe extending through the eye. Now, the patterns can uh, look similar and sometimes from a distance, you just don't get a good enough look. So again, the best thing you can do is take a picture of what you see when you're not sure what it is. Um, some of our native king snakes, rat snakes, and racers are also commonly confused with Burmese pythons due to their patterns. Um, while the pattern may look similar, the key thing here is the colors are going to be different. So on the top right, you see a corn snake, which is typically more red, sometimes gray. They do have variable colors. Um, and even a juvenile rat snake, you can see, will have that patterning, which will fade as it grows larger. And a juvenile racer here as well could be confused with a, a hatchling Burmese python because of the pattern. But as they grow larger, they're actually gonna become basically almost all black with a white underside. And then the Florida king snake, which is, for those of us who may not like snakes, here's one that you will definitely be a fan of because they actually eat other snakes. That's one of the reasons that they're called the king snake. Um, because of their pattern, they could be commonly confused. But again, it's the colors that you have to look for with these individuals. And then I'm gonna talk about some of, just quickly here, our venomous and protected species. So on the left here, this is an Eastern indigo. And the, the reason that I put this one in here, it's not venomous, it's actually quite harmless to humans, um, but it's one of, it's actually the largest snake we have here that's native to Florida and the longest snake in North America. So because of its large size, it can grow up to eight feet long. Um, you might think that it's not supposed to be here, but consider yourself lucky if you see one of these. Um, they're called an indigo because of their color, so they tend to have this dark black um, bluish color, and sometimes the adults will have that red on their face and underside. And two of our native snakes that actually do have that dark stripe running through and behind their eye are two of our venomous species, the Eastern Diamondback and Cottonmouth. So because of the location and pattern, you may find these in the same areas where Burmese pythons are gonna be and potentially confuse them. But here are the key features to look for. Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes, they're called the rattlesnake because they have a rattle. So if you can safely um, get a good enough look, look or listen for the rattle. That's gonna be the key thing to tell you that that is not a python. And they also have these diamond um, patterns on their back as the name indicates. And with the cotton mouth, it's actually a behavioral distinction that's gonna give you um, basically the, the key giveaway here is they'll point their mouth to the sky and open it wide and you'll see that white inside of their mouth when they're in defense. Um, and that's why they're called a cottonmouth. So that behavioral distinction is one of the key things to look for. Um, but these all can grow um, quite large and due to the pattern, location, and size, um, understandably are confused for Burmese pythons. So those are some tips to 
look for when identifying these species. But um, again, the best thing you can do is get a photograph and an expert will help you identify it. I'm throwing in a bonus species here because you all are in um, West Palm Beach or at least the general area where you might find this guy. So this is a Nile monitor lizard, which is one of our larger reptiles that's been introduced to Florida. It's actually one of the four largest lizards in Florida that is invasive. So there's an established population on the C-51 canal and in West Palm Beach. Um, these can grow up to seven feet long and are generalist predators. So one of the main reasons that they're a concern to our environment is because in their native range, they're known nest predators of the Nile crocodile. They will actively seek out and eat crocodile eggs, which is a concern for our federal, federally threatened American crocodile, as well as American alligators in South Florida, two of our native crocodilians. And there's a second population of these over on the West Coast, which is actually the largest population of Nile monitors in South Florida, which happens to coincide with one of the largest populations of burrowing owls. And they have been known to um, eat burrowing owl eggs. So they are a concern for a number of our native species and they travel across both land and water. So they're in a, a semi-aquatic lizard. So when you're looking for them, Here's what to keep an eye out for. Mainly, they're going to be found along bodies of water, like canals. Um, so, really, the same areas that you're going to be looking for some of these non native constrictors. When alarmed, they'll dive into the water. And this is one pictured, actually, this picture was taken on the C 51 canal, which runs along Southern Boulevard. And you can see it's pretty well camouflaged against the vegetation. Um, but one of the key things that distinguishes this species from green iguanas and other iguanas which are commonly confused for Nile monitors is um, these yellow bands above and below the eye and across their body you'll see this yellow spotted patterning but the, the biggest thing is this long flat rudder-like tail that helps them swim in the water. Iguanas are going to have a much skinnier tail so that's one of the first things that you'll notice from a distance. So all of these are what we consider priority reptiles to be on the lookout for. What do you do when you see one? Well, luckily there has been an interagency um, developed system where you can report um, species, invasive species to somebody who's able to respond or help you identify what you saw. And that's called I've Got One. So there's both a smartphone application and a website you can use to report what you see online. And those are um, pretty fast and streamlined. But one of the fastest ways to get somebody to respond is by calling the 1888 I've Got One Invasive Species hotline and describing what you saw. So now we're just going to walk through how this system works and how to use it. Um, and then we'll get to some of your questions. So if you see an invasive species, whether it's one of the ones that I mentioned today or an invasive plant, um, anything you're unsure about, take a photograph of it and report it as soon as possible. And that really helps reduce the amount of time it would take for somebody to go and respond to that. So take a picture, note the location. And I also wanna mention that you can report both live and dead invasive species. Um, some, some of the new occurrences of already introduced species or even new introductions have been the result of first seeing one dead. So that's still valuable information if you see something dead on the road or in your own backyard and you don't think it's supposed to be here, take a picture and report that. So for those of us who use smartphones, um, this is, you can download the I've Got One app from either Google Play um, or for iPhone and Android systems through the App Store. And this is what you'll see when you open the app. So we'll use the example of non-native constrictors since that's a big focus of what we've covered today. What you'll do is click on this tile here for animals and it'll take you to this list. Then you can click on snakes and it'll come up with this nice list with 
convenient photos for reference to see if this looks like what you saw. If you still don't know what it is, you can always select unidentified Python. And then the next step is this is what you'll see on your screen. You're going to upload or attach an image if you were able to get an image. Snakes do move quickly, so we understand you're not always able to get a photograph. Um, so if you aren't able to get a photograph, the best thing to do is describe what you saw in as much detail as possible in the notes. The next step is going to be to select your location from the map. Now, one of the cool features with this app is if you have location services turned on, it'll automatically take your location, whether um, you have service or not, you can actually save your point from where you are or do that later. So you can select the exact point if you know exactly where it was or draw a polygon with your finger to indicate the general area if you don't remember exactly where it was. The following steps are pretty straightforward. Um, so basically you want, you want to select how much time you spent observing the species, whether you saw one or multiple. But this is the most important area is the notes. You, if you can describe in as much detail what you saw as possible, such as exact number, whether there were multiple individuals or not, um, the general estimated size, behavior, what it was doing, that's all information that's helpful when verifying reports and confirming what you saw. Um, one of the things that's not so straightforward, and the reason for this is this app is designed to be used when you're outdoors, even if you don't have cell service. So it's gonna, when you click save on your report, it'll actually bring it to your upload queue. And you'll have to be sure to go back to your home screen. And this will tell you, you have something in queue to upload, click on that and upload your report later on when you have cell service. Um, I can't emphasize enough that Report sightings as soon as you see them immediately. Um, you can call this hotline 1888. I've got one during normal business hours. Say you called during after hours, um, you can always leave a message and someone will assist you on the next business day. If you have an after hours emergency or happen to see and want to report illegal wildlife activity, take note of this 24 hour wildlife alert hotline, and that's where you can report. Um, suspicious activity. And again, all this information I'll be sure to share with Elaine to distribute to you afterwards. So I know this was a lot of information. Um, I'm hoping to get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, and all of this is not to scare you, but more so alert you to the potential for seeing some of these invasive species. So um, we'll share some additional resources at the end because I know this was a lot to throw at you, but let's go ahead and take some of your questions and go ahead and answer some of those now. Yes, thank you, Justin. We have a lot of questions, so um, I want to get to those. One question was, are these snakes aggressive? If, if I see one out in the wild and I'm trying to report it, do I need to you know, see it and then walk away so that I'm safe or, or what's the best um, way to go about that? So that's a good question. Um, my best answer for that is in my experience, these snakes typically are not aggressive unless provoked. Um, so the best thing you can do is just keep your distance. Um, don't bother it, leave it be if you're afraid to approach it. Um, with pets, definitely keep your pets attended and on a leash. Um, but they're not going to chase after you and attack you generally. There have actually been no um, wild pythons in, in Florida that have killed humans, and they rarely attack. And most of those are the result of provoking the animal or the animal was in captivity. So um, definitely not a huge concern that they're going to be aggressive unless you're bothering it. Okay. And speaking of pets, if... Um... If say I have a backyard, maybe um, near kind of a, a remote area, um, should I be worried about any of these snakes coming into my backyard and maybe attacking a pet or anything like that? Do you have any tips for that? 
It's always possible. Like I said, these are opportunistic and generalist predators. So they're not always going to know the difference between, say, a small dog and a cat or a raccoon. So my best advice for you is, um, like I said, don't leave your pets unattended, especially at night, and always keep them on a leash. And have you noticed any impacts of climate change altering the range of certain invasive species? So that's a question that um, a number of researchers are, are still hoping to learn and better understand. Um, there have been some data to come out that have come out to um, predict basically what would happen uh, with climate change and would Burmese pythons and other animals that are invasive to Florida potentially expand their range? And the answer is unknown, um, but from some of the climate modeling, we, we do predict that, you know, Burmese pythons, for example, could potentially extend beyond the frost line of South Florida. We don't know that they would extend um, too far into North Florida or even beyond that yet. That's a question we're still hoping to learn. But with some large lizards, um, there was a really great study that came out last year on the Argentine black and white tegu, which is another large lizard you can find in South Florida. And because they're a more, uh, they tend to burrow underground, they, they can be more cold tolerant than some of these uh, large constrictors by basically surviving the colder months underground where it's warmer. And that climate modeling showed that they have the potential to expand as far north as the Carolinas. So that's a big concern. Um, that's definitely a question that's on all of our minds and we're hoping to better understand with time. Definitely. Um, one very specific question. Can a Burmese python live in a nature preserve that has been recently flooded in Palm Beach County? I would say certainly. Um, we know that they're found in both disturbed and natural areas. I'm not sure what particular reserve they're referring to, but um, yeah, so these animals are typically associated with wet locations. So especially if it had just been flooded, there's a good chance you could potentially find a python there. Um, it depends on the location because like I said, they, they don't usually extend north of the frost line. Um, so, there's always a chance. And what is the front, like how far north have pythons been found? That's a good question. Um, so off the top of my head, I'm not sure exactly where the northernmost sighting is, but typically south of Lake Okeechobee, what we consider the historic Everglades is kind of, that encapsulates the range of Burmese pythons. Okay. Um, and what are the main predators in the home territories of some of the invasive species that you have discussed? The main predators in the home range? That's a good question. Um, so with large constrictors, there are predators like big cats, but typically they are the top predator in the ecosystem. Um, so they're gonna be at the top of the food chain for the most part. And that's one of the reasons that they have been such, such successful invaders in South Florida. We actually don't really have many predators that are used to or know to pursue um, pythons as adults anyway. But when they're hatchlings, when they're young, uh, they can be prey for a number of different species, including things like wading birds or birds of prey. They could easily pick up a six to 12 inch hatchling Burmese python. Okay. And I know the audience has had some questions about cane toads and um, Justin shared with me before the presentation, a video from a um, professor at the University of Florida who specializes in that topic. So I know that there have been some questions about cane toads and we are going to send that out with the follow-up email um, to provide more details about that. Um, and we have one question as a follow-up for the last one that you just addressed. Um, so why are they so bad here, but not in their own territory? Um, so the reason that they're a problem here is that, like I said, they're, you're taking a species that is not meant to be in this ecosystem as it's historically been, and basically throwing off the balance of the food chain. You're introducing a top predator. Um, in their native range, they are already a part of that ecosystem and they serve their role as top predators. So um, 
there are a few predators that will keep them in check, but actually the healthiest population of Burmese pythons in the world is here in Florida, um, not in their native range. So they're, they're not doing quite as well there. I want to get to one last question before we're going to launch the poll. So please stay with us just a few more minutes. Um, and so we have a question in the chat. I have seen many small black, green, and black with orange ring on the and bottom side. I'm not quite understanding this. Um, I don't know. Abba, can you maybe reword your question? Because I'm not quite, as I'm reading through it, I'm not quite understanding, but I want Justin to address it if, um, if he can. So she's seeing many small black, green, and black with orange ring and bottom side snakes in her yard that she assumes are not dangerous, but they're not invasive because you didn't mention them. I, I would assume though, Justin, that you have not covered all of the invasive species though, right? <laughs> I've, so I covered the, the three in what we consider invasive established large constrictors. That said, there are other introduced species that you could find, um, but there are a number of other native snakes as well that I have not gotten to. So Abba, my best advice for you is take a picture and send that in to I've got one if you're not sure what it is. Um, it'll be hard to really give a accurate identification without a photograph. So yeah, keep an eye out and try and get a photo next time if you can. Awesome, thank you. And we, again, we are gonna be sending out links and um, every, all the information that Justin has shared today, including a copy of the presentation will be sent out to everyone. So you guys can flip back through these slides um, and, and kind of take your time going through them so that you can identify or become more familiar with identifying the snakes. So I am going to go ahead and launch our poll. This is a really important feedback poll for us um, so that we can, we can get some, just some feedback from you guys and see how the program went. Um, so please, before you guys do sign off, please take some time to just fill this out. It is seven questions and shouldn't take too long, but I'm going to keep that open. And I'm going to try and share my screen as well while we're doing the poll. I'm not quite sure if that will work. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah. Looks like it works. Does that look right to you, Justin? Is it showing yes. up? Okay. I'm seeing right. the main page we saw when we started. Yes. So while we're doing the poll, um, so I'm going to just talk about our next Friday program. So next Friday, we're talking about a completely different topic, but something that you may be interested in. It'll be rules of the road, bike safety with upcycle. Um, if you are in West Palm Beach, you may be familiar with um, with upcycle. So we're going to be talking with Juan and just learning the rules of the road and making sure that everyone's staying safe now that people, more and more people are out there biking and we just want everyone to be safe. So we're going to go over that. Um, and this is us, the Office of Sustainability. That's our main page, wpb.org slash green. We have a lot of great programs and free resources that we offer. So I do encourage you to visit our webpage. And we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as at WPB Green. And I know Justin, I know the Croc Docs are on. You have Facebook, Twitter. Do you have Instagram? Yep, we're on all those platforms. Awesome. So I will be sending that. I'll get that information from you too, just to make sure that I have everything that's correct. And we'll be sending that out. So looks like we're still waiting on some people to, to chime in. So we'll leave this open for just a few more minutes. We'll hang out. If anyone else has any more questions though, if you're done taking the poll, um, we have Justin here for a few more minutes. So we can ask his, um, you know, pick his brain to see if he can answer any more questions if anyone has any questions. I do have some other ones actually, now that, I, now that I'm saying that, there were some other ones that we didn't quite get to. Um, someone was wondering, if you know, um, if there are any plans to reintroduce rabbits in the Everglades. Do you know anything about that? 
I'm not aware of that. Um, like I said, my focus is on really reptile and amphibian research. Um, I'm not aware of any plans to reintroduce rabbits, but I know that rabbits are one of the mammals that have been um, pretty drastically affected by the python introduction. Okay, um, let's see, what else? What else do we have on here? What happens to the animals once they are captured? Good question. So that's not something that I, I covered. Um, so with Burmese pythons, most of them unfortunately have to be euthanized and they're done so humanely. Um, but what that allows us is the opportunity to really collect data on what they're eating and look at their diet. Um, some of the animals that are captured actually go and take part in other research programs. So like I mentioned, the scout snakes, some of those animals are tagged and re-released to help detect and, and find more other um, adults in breeding aggregations. So it just depends on the situation, but because there are so many of them in Florida, really the only option that we have at this point is to euthanize them. Okay. Well, we, you know, we all, we know that the most humane and right thing, you know, has to be done and we have one more question. What, these questions are a little jumped up. Um, this one looks to be like, it is about iguanas. And I think we're going to just send out maybe a link with some more information about iguanas and iguana control after um, in the follow-up email, since we didn't really touch on that today. Um, but. It looks like everyone has voted, or not voted, but completed the survey. So I think with that, I'm gonna share the results. You can see. And with that, I, I think we're gonna wrap up. Um, I just want to say thank you again, Justin, for joining us today. This was a really great program. And um, I know there have been just a lot of questions that we couldn't get to on many different topics of invasive species. But we do really appreciate you sharing everything that you did today. And I hope, you know, according to the poll results, it looks like people have definitely learned a lot from today's program. So we really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elaine, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to tune in. All right, thank you, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your Friday, a great weekend, and a great holiday season. Bye. Everyone.